Hello Year 12. So today we're going to carry on uh, work looking at temperature control. So last lesson you um, actually had some time to do some prep and some reading on your own about endotherms and also reviewing your work on ectotherms. So today we're going to look at endotherms. We've got some lovely pictures here um, of some examples of endotherms. Remember endotherms are mammals and birds. Okay, um, so what we need to do is describe the feedback loop involved in maintaining body temperature in endotherm. So we've got a negative feedback idea we're going to be looking at um, and recalling hopefully because you'll have done some prep. Um, explaining the physiological mechanisms involved, looking at the pros and cons of ectothermic and endothermic um, life. We're going to focus on um, endotherms today and then you're going to have a little activity to compare the two. Um, and then you're going to be doing some questions to apply your knowledge. So, first thing I want to do, you had the prep sheet um, looking at um, ectotherms, and endoth or endotherms, sorry, um, and I want you to look at how well you have filled in the flow diagram or made your notes based on that and add information as we go through. So the next slide is going to go through the negative feedback loop and I'll talk to you and add a little bit. So listen up if you want to pause it, obviously pause the video and you can add extra notes. So, the key thing to remember is that endothermic temperature control is mainly physiological. So whereas ectotherms tend to be quite structural and behavioral in their responses to maintain um, body temperature, um, we've got a lot of physiology going on inside the organisms in endotherms to maintain their core body temperature. And the exothermic reactions, i.e. respiration, the release of heat energy, um, is providing that internal source of heat to maintain that body temperature above the environment around them. So. I've split, you can see I've split my loop in half here. So we've got red for meaning hot and blue for meaning cool or colder. And then we've got our set point optimum with a smiley face in it. Okay, so um, key things. We have two sorts of receptors um, for detecting temperature. You have peripheral thermoreceptors in the skin and you have the temperature receptors in the hypothalamus itself, um, which detects your core body temperature. So you've got detecting external temperature in the periphery. Periphery means around the outside. Um, and you have got core body temperature receptors. Now, it's really useful to have both of these um, because um, you have got then two warning systems, if you like, two sources of sensory information that's going to be feeding into the thermoregulatory center in the hypothalamus um, to detect any change. So here we're seeing a rise in core body temperature. So for example, it could be that you're doing exercise and your muscles are working harder um, and therefore um, you are generating more heat through some more respiration going on. It could be that the you're out in the sun sunbathing and you're absorbing more heat from ra solar radiation or it's just a hotter environment. So your thermoreceptors in your skin are going to detect that rise in temperature on the outside. And the big benefit of having the peripheral receptors is you can have this preemptive response to changes because the key thing is we don't want your core body temperature to change it has to be controlled within about one degree c of this this optimum um, and or this set point so if the environment is changing and it could be leading to a change in um, your core body temperature it can send um, nerve impulses to the thermoregulatory center and say it's getting hotter in this case, um, you might want to start doing things to help the body cool down. Okay, I lose heat because otherwise your core temperature might be going up and it could be dangerous. Okay, it's obviously not saying that because it's just nerve impulses, but that's how the thermoregulatory center will detect it. And in your thermoregulatory center, you've got what's called sometimes called the heat loss center, and that's going to take this information about the right either the rise the rising core body temperature or a potential rise in core body temperature and said nerve impulses down the through the autonomic motor neurons so autonomic just means the automatic nervous system to the effectors which are in your skin and in your muscles mainly so key things that are going to happen then major one that's going to happen in your skin is that the arterioles um, that supply your skin capillaries are going to dilate um, which means that more blood is going to pass through your skin capillaries 
the more heat is going to be lost by radiation. So that warm blood from your core is taken quite nearer to the skin, more, or rather more of it is going through your skin so it can radiate that heat out to the environment. Remember, your blood vessels never move. Capillaries cannot dilate. Have you written that? It's wrong. Remember, capillaries are one cell thick. They've got no muscle in them. It's the blood vessels that are supplying them that can change their diameter by contracting that circular muscle, um, smooth circular muscle in the um, middle layer of the arterioles. Equally, you've also got um, shunts, um, which are called the arteriovenous shunts, that can bypass capillaries. Because obviously if you shut off the blood supply to the capillaries in the skin, the blood needs to be able to go somewhere else. So you have these arteriovenous shunts. So here's the arteriole coming in, and this is the shunt, which can bypass the skin capillaries. And here with vasodilation, the capillaries, uh, sorry, the arteriole here is dilated, so the muscles there have relaxed. More blood's going through the capillaries near the surface of the skin, um, so more heat is radiating um, out into the environment and less blood is going through the shunt. So this one's being constricted. Okay. Other things that will be going on is the hairs on your body. I mean, humans are not very hairy, so hairs don't really do very much for us. But think about other organisms as well. Hairs lying down flat. Um, similarly with birds, their feathers would lie down flat. Um, so trapping less air, so less insulation, so more easy for heat to radiate out into the environment and be lost. You're going to sweat more, okay, um, and that means you're going to lose more heat as the water evaporates. It takes heat from the skin um, and cools the skin down, which therefore cools the blood because the um, blood's flowing through the skin capillaries, all right, which will therefore cool your core body temperature down overall. Remember you can put in ideas about the latent heat of vaporization here, the heat energy required to make that water evaporate. And it's really useful because a small amount of water loss can lose a large amount of heat energy from the body. Also obviously dangerous if you get wet or have wet clothes on, you get a lot of heat cooling because of evaporation. Okay, you've also got things like um, panting um, to increase um, evaporation so lots of an some animals don't really sweat very much so dogs don't really sweat other than uh, I think in their paws um, so they have to cool themselves down um, by panting um, similar to that gaping shown in crocodiles and things like that but um, so evaporative cooling you also your metabolic rate will tend to fall when you don't need if you're not obviously if you're doing exercise that's not going to work but if you're in a hot environment your basal metabolic rate tends to drop you do a little bit less respiration um, to release less heat energy other things you can do so they're physiological changes um, other things that you can do obviously is go and find some shade orientate your body out of the sun or just become less active why do you think people in Mediterranean countries things like have siestas? They're just resting during the hottest part of the day where it's silly to be active, where you're in danger of getting too hot. All these things will help reduce your core body temperature back down to the set point. Okay. So what about if it gets cooler? So for example, um, you are outside on a cool day or it's a bit windy, um, heat's being extracted from your skin a bit more quickly, you're radiating more heat to the environment because it's colder. Um, your peripheral thermoreceptors in your skin are going to take that fall. Also, if your core body temperature starts to fall, it'll also send nerve impulses to thermoregulatory centre again. You've then got a different centre, so the heat gain centre, um, send nerve impulses down different um, motor neurons to different regions um, in the muscles um, and in the skin so the key thing is your arterial supplying your skin capillaries now are going to constrict and the arteriovenous shunt is going to dilate so if less blood is going to go through the capillaries you're going to lose less heat by radiation so in other words we are less blood is going through your skin capillaries here i'm showing you a different diagram because in the exam they might show you different diagrams all right so or in books we'll have different diagrams so we've got less blood going through the capillaries here and we've got more blood bypassing the skin capillaries. This is why your skin goes pale when you're cold. So it's just less blood flowing through the skin because you're trying to keep that heat in the core and away from your periphery. 
okay um, but the key thing is it's called vasoconstriction of the blood vessels supplying the capillaries it's not about the, the bypass or the shunt okay we're also going to have hairs on your body standing up to trap air which is an insulator so you're going to radiate less heat out to the environment lose less heat okay obviously much more useful in animals that are very hairy or furry or have lots of feathers think about birds how they puff their feathers up in the winter when they're cold that traps the heat uh, or traps the air which then traps the heat because air is a poor conductor of heat so you get less heat loss you don't make as much sweat remember sweating will release water onto your skin which evaporates and takes heat energy so if you produce less sweat you're going to lose less heat by evaporative cooling that's another thing is if you ever fall into water for example and you're cold and you have wet clothes on you should it's actually better to take them off and have no clothes on than keep wet clothes on because the wet clothes will con a the water will conduct heat away from your skin and then the water is evaporating and it's taking even more heat energy to do that you're in real danger of hypothermia okay um, key thing is um, another physiological thing is your what is called your voluntary muscles which is your skeletal muscle will involuntary contract your nerve impulse being sent by your autonomic nervous system but you can't control to make those muscles contract um, because that will make them work more which means more exothermic reactions and more respiration so um, you've got more heat release and actually your basal metabolic rate will go up too Okay, so actually when the environment's colder, your basal rate of respiration will be higher. So actually, little, if you want to lose weight easily without having to do um, too much exercises, turn your central heating down a little bit um, so you're in a cooler environment and you will actually use more heat energy, uh, sorry, more energy just to keep your body warm. Okay, um, obviously you can do things like go and bask in the sun if you're a bit cold. Um, obviously humans might not go and bask in the sun but how many animals might orientate your body um, to a bigger surface area exposed to the sun move about more actually be more physically active you know going out and running around in the cold you don't feel cold after a while because all that respiration going on in your muscles is going to release lots of heat energy okay um, for humans obviously we turn the heating up or put more clothes on and your key behavioral things all of those things are either going to reduce the amount of heat loss or actually increase heat release from respiration so there's two things here that you can do okay so we can change our rate of respiration and we've got these physiological changes here in terms of reducing heat loss all of this is going to um, help to raise our body temperature back up towards normal set point as long as it doesn't go too far there's a limit to all this homeostatic cycle if it gets too hot it gets too cold homeostasis cannot bring it back in line um, and you would get either hyperthermia if you get too hot or hypothermia if you get too cold um, and actually some of the things to do with um, trying to warm you up when you are getting cold can actually be, end up being counterproductive because remember we talked about directing blood away from your skin and your periphery when you're cold to keep your core body temperature remember it's always about core body temperature that's important well, actually, if you start shivering and you're already really cold, that means blood has to go to the muscles to supply them. And that means you're taking warm blood with heat to the muscles which are cold and you're taking it to the periphery. So you've got a risk of actually losing more heat because you're taking warm blood to the periphery than you're generating through um, respiration. Um, and that actually can be really negative when you're going into hypothermia. Um, it becomes a sort of positive feedback loop and you start losing more and more heat energy okay um, other things you can do is curl up into a ball make yourself small and tiny okay reduce your surface area to volume ratio as much as possible okay so hopefully you've got some of those ideas if you want to add any more to your notes take a few minutes pause the video here um, and add those notes okay other little things that you might want to think about have a think about oh, how does body shape matter how does fur blubber hibernation and estivation um, help do you have you heard of those do you know what they do have a think for a minute so polar bear actually covers quite a few of these things you think about polar bear what's his body shape like 
big and round. So what does that mean for surface area to volume ratio? Small surface area to volume ratio, which means heat can't get out as easily. Okay, there's less surface area for heat to escape on escape from relative to its volume. Okay, so being big and round is a real big adaptation for living in cold environments. It reduces your rate of heat loss. And they have loads of fur. They have, I think they have hollow fur, traps heat air permanently in, in there. So they've got that insulating layer. They've also got a thick layer of blubber underneath, which is a thermal insulator. And their skin is also black, um, so that when the sun does come down, they can absorb that heat radiation from the sun, but then their fur traps the heat that would be coming out of their body. They've also got small ears. Okay, so less heat loss through their ears. Um, hibernation, here's a little uh, dormouse maybe, um, hibernating, surviving over the winter. They're tiny little creatures. Look at the size of these. This is just grass here, wheat, um, dead wheat. Um, you can see it's rolled itself up into a ball, small, trying to make its surface air to volume ratio as small as possible. It's very difficult for them to survive because they are so tiny. And we'll talk about that problem in a minute. Okay. Now, estivation actually is more common in ectotherms when it's very, very hot. So hibernation happens when it's cold um, to survive when there's not much food over the winter. But actually, this is where you, uh, organisms become dormant when it's very hot or very dry. So you can see on this, this is in Australia, all these snails here on these metal posts, they've become dormant and just sort of welded themselves down to the post and they can actually survive for huge lengths of time being completely dormant when it's hot, so they're not being active. So they reduce their metabolic rate right down. And actually similarly here in hibernation, they reduce their metabolic rate right down, heart rate drops really, really, really low um, so that they're conserving their energy stores while they're sleeping and things like bears and um, squirrels and things like that do that. It's really important they have enough food um, or they can gather enough food during the um, spring and summer to have enough food stores stored in their bodies to survive. Okay, And actually organisms um, waking up too early um, because of it suddenly gets warm and think about climate change and issues like that can actually affect their survival because they, they wake up um, and but there's not the food around or they're they end up using up their food source stores so, so it can be a real problem so those are other little features you might think about when looking at temperature control body size is really important and shape so let's have a little think about pros and cons now okay just have a think well what's the benefits of being an endotherm and what are the cons have a think for about two minutes what benefits can think of you might think about well, what are the pros and cons of being an ectotherm and see how you can switch them up for this okay so key things about pros whole point is you can maintain your body temperature despite the environmental surroundings and some organisms of polar bears can survive to minus 50 degrees c in this in the external environment because of the adaptations they have evolved to have the key thing is that means you can be active even in low temperatures so you can take advantage of prey and actually you can also cope with higher temperatures maybe sometimes okay um, it means you can also escape from predators okay so you can be more active even at low temperatures and maybe find prey they might be dormant because they might be um, ectotherms and, but you can also escape from predators because you're still able to be active you can maybe inhabit a wider variety of places around the planet, especially colder places. However, there's some significant cons, downsides if you like. Un you know, this is like the opposite of what ectotherms have. You have to use a significant, significant proportion of your energy to maintain your body temperature, which means you have to eat more. You have to be more active all the time finding food less of the energy you take, a lower proportion of the energy you take in is going to be used for growth, so potentially you're going to be slower growing, possibly. Or you need to eat a lot more to be able to grow quickly. And because you have these really complex um, homeostatic mechanisms, you've got hyperthermia if you get too hot and hypothermia if you get too cold, 
And remember, we've got that very narrow range of core body temperature that is survivable, whereas ectotherms, their core body temperature can fluctuate wildly and they can generally survive that. Whereas we can't, if our core body temperature falls you know, by more than about one degree C, we start to get really ill and potentially die. Whereas some organisms can almost freeze um, and they won't and they'll just come back to life afterwards and that wouldn't happen with us. So maybe just have a think to make some notes on that. Okay, so let's cut these pictures on your prep sheet. Can you think about them? Um, how do you think their size affects heat loss? Okay, we've already mentioned that. Do elephants conform to your ideas about adaptations for living in hot or cold environments? And how do you think that affects food con consumption? That's about their size. Have a think. So elephants, large, sur large surface area to volume ratio or small? Small, big and round, aren't they elephants? But they live in hot places, although they can live in cool places as well. Um, they tend to live in hot places. So actually heat loss, you'd want them to be able to lose heat. Um, so how have they evolved? Well, they have big ears, which act as radiators. So even though they've sort of the shape of a polar bear, if you like, um, they have big ears. Also, they don't have very much fur. Okay, um, this poor little guy here, little mouse, tiny. What does that mean? Well, that means their surface area to volume ratio is quite big, which means they lose heat rapidly. So that means a much greater proportion of the energy that they eat will be lost as heat compared to like the elephant. So some animals, some small rodents, have to eat nearly their entire body weight in, um, in food um, every day just to stay alive. Okay, some small birds, like hummingbirds as well, um, they're so tiny and also so metabolically active, they have to feed almost constantly, otherwise they will die. Um, so in proportion, even though elephants eat a bigger mass of food than a dormouse does, as a proportion of its body weight, it doesn't have to eat anywhere near as much as a dormouse might have to, or a shrew or something like that. Okay, because these guys, these little guys are going to be losing heat energy much more quickly. Think about where these animals live in um, tent, you know, hot cl climates, places like that. They'll have a burrow so they can survive at night when it's really cold as well. Um, lots of ideas and things to think about, about what the adaptations are, what helps them. Okay. So as you're going through, when you're looking at questions and things like that, you think about what are the things that are going on? You know, lungs, mouth, nose, so evaporation, sweat glands, you know, think about water, think about evaporation, evaporative cooling, think about um, think about latent heat of vaporization. Um, hairs on the skin, and the humans aren't very scary, um, aren't very hairy, we might be scary, but we are not very hairy. Um, and that's, but in other animals, massive insulation because it's trapping air. Remember about your arterioles and relation to skin capillaries. Liver cells, that's about respiration. Okay, so how much your body is doing respiration and your skeletal muscles as well. So always think about those things when you think about endotherms. Okay, so what I'd like you to do now is basically you've got two tasks that I've sent, two worksheets that I've sent you. One is a um, exotherm versus endotherm muddle. Um, it's all muddled up. Use it in the word in the word document and move the words around to make to a nice table comparing ectotherms and endotherms, and with comparison statements that go next to each other, um, should make sense when you look at that. And then there's a worksheet with a load of um, ranked questions, varying degree of difficulty. Um, have a go at least three of them. Try and do at least one challenging one. See how far you can get, and try and pick a range. So if the ones look like it's a similar question to a previous question, try and choose something different. Okay, so pick three of those questions. That would be great. Thank you.